so, how to write a book review? Well, be, let's begin with the question, what is a book review? Okay, and I already made the point that there is a difference between a book review and a book report. Probably all of us have written book reports, and usually the purpose behind it is the professor just wants to know you read the book. Okay? A book review goes beyond that. The analogy that I like to use is uh, the difference between, in, you know, you're watching a sporting event on TV, the difference between the play-by-play -play guy and the color commentary. Okay, play-by-play -play is just a summary of what's happening, right? That's a book report. This is what the book is about, just a summary. The play-by-play, -play, though, goes beyond that and analyzes what's going on, right? Gives you background information, gives you stats, uh, explains what's going on in the field, uh, talks about the plays, analyzes the strengths and weaknesses of the players. That's more what a book review is. It includes the play-by-play. -play. You can't do the, co the commentary unless you've got the play-by-play. -play. So you're going to have some summary, we'll see, in the book review. Uh, but the review is the commentary, the analysis, the, uh, the understanding of what the author is trying to do, and then an evaluation of that. So a book review, uh, here are some, some of the elements of, the book, of a good book review that we'll talk about. Number one, sorry, it's a little small writing. Uh, identify the author's purpose. For writing, we'll talk about that. Number two, identify the author's, author's thesis, and it's important to distinguish between the two. A lot of book reviews I read cite the author's purpose as his thesis, and we'll talk about the difference. Number three, identify the arguments used in support of the thesis by the author. Four, Evaluate the arguments and not just give an unfounded assessment of the arguments, but actually support your analysis. Okay, this is weak or this is strong because, and give some thoughtful interaction. And finally, then draw conclusions about the book's usefulness and impact. Okay, because of all of that, who would best read this book? What is the best use of this book? Okay, so we'll, we're going to explore all of these areas uh, as we go through how to write a good book review. But I want to address the question uh, next, though. Why, why write a book review? Why do your professors assign book reviews in the, in the first place? Uh, and I want to address this because typically a lot of students think, well, the only reason for this is just to prove I've read the book. Okay? And that's why a lot of students just write book summaries. But I want to I want to argue that there's a more substantial purpose behind reading and behind writing a book review, uh, and and why uh, I expect more than just a summary. Number one, the best way to develop your own thinking is by evaluating the thinking of others. Uh, we're all about thinking, obviously, here, uh, thinking through what Scripture teaches with regard to worship and church music. Uh, thinking through the implications of scripture and then practical application. Especially in our worship and ministry courses, that's what we're focusing on, obviously. It's not just about memorizing facts, it's about drawing implications and wrestling through these things, especially at the graduate level. One of the best ways to do that and to improve your own thinking is by reading other good thinkers, or even bad thinkers. Uh, you can learn from the good and the bad of other thinkers. So that's one of the reasons we do this. Second, to better understand the literature and ideas in your field. Obviously, professors assign you books that they think are important to read in your area or in the area, the topic area of the class. And so a, a thorough analysis of that book is going to help you understand better the ideas. Or uh, I do this a lot in our depth classes. I'll let you choose a book that contributes to your, your final research project. And so obviously then there's obviously then there's benefit of really going deep in a couple books that contribute to your paper and uh, gives you a better knowledge of what's going on rather than just a, a surface knowledge. Writing a book review then just practically is a good introduction for someone else who's not read the book. Many of you know we uh, publish an annual journal of uh, worship and church music here through our school uh, called The Artistic Theologian and we include book reviews. One of the reasons is we review any new book that's coming out in the past year on the subject of worship and music, and it's a way for people who don't have time to read them all to get a basic introduction. So just practically speaking, there's a benefit there. And that's where the summary 
does have a place. Uh, also, the, these next two are sort of related. To practice writing for an academic audience, a book review is an academic exercise. It's not a blog. It's not, a, it's not something casual. It's an academic exercise. And so it gives you a practice in that that's a little bit simpler than writing a full-blown research project or a full-blown journal article. Along with that, writing book reviews is the first step towards academic publishing. If you have any aspirations at all, and I hope many of you do, of writing academically in your career, journal articles, full-length volumes, book reviews are the first step. It gives you the tools and the practice in a simpler format of writing academically so that you can then write journal articles for publication and then eventually uh, full-length volume. So it's, it's practical in that respect, especially for those of you who are more inclined towards that. This is a workshop on how to write a book review, but we're going to spend about the first half of our time talking about how to read a book. Okay? And you think, well, I know how to read. You know, duh. Uh, but really, 90% of the um, of the work involved in writing the book review is having a strategy towards reading it well so that you can discern what's going on in the book and then put it in print. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this. I highly recommend this book by Mortimer Adler, How to Read a Book. Okay, and obviously he's more than, you know, he's more than talking about phonics in this thing. Uh, this is a, a very helpful, easy to read, uh, uh, um, really wealth of tools on how to approach reading in all genre uh, so that you can really get the most out of it. And he talks about various levels of reading and how to work through it. It's very, very helpful. And I'll use some of his material here uh, just in this introduction. Uh, so the prerequisite for writing a good book review obviously is being able to read a book. So here, is, here are some elements of strategy that I'd like to suggest to you that will help you as you read a book for the purpose of writing a critical book review. Number one, budget your time. In other words, and you'll see with the method I'm laying out here, you can't expect to finish reading the book the night before the review is due because there's more than just reading it in, uh, that's required in order to write a good book review. So you've got to Figure out what time you have, and I would suggest, I do this all the time, with the strategy I'm laying out, sort of, sort of plan out when you're going to do what. How long is it going to take you to, do, uh, to read the book th through the, the method I'm going to show you. Develop sort of a plan. Uh, have a purpose and a strategy, which is what, what we're talking about here. Read actively. You can't read uh, a, phil a, a philosophical book for the purpose of writing a book review in the same way you're going to read a novel. Reading a novel is uh, an, uh, an exercise in entertainment and leisure. Profitable, I think. You benefit from it, but, if you, but it's different from reading for the purpose of writing a review. You've got to read actively, and some of the tools I'm going to suggest will help you do that. <laughs> read it three times. <laughs> okay, now. I don't mean read every word three times, so don't worry, okay? You'll only really read the book once, but I suggest going through the book three times if you really want to understand it and know what's going on. And it's, and it's very, very doable. Um, Adler talks about different levels of reading, and that's really what I'm building off of, okay? So here are, here are the three stages, and you'll see only one of them is really reading the book. Two of them on either side are going through the book for specific purposes. I'm using a little bit of Adler's terminology with some adjustment. He talks about elementary reading, uh, inspectional reading, and then analytical. I'm sort of mixing the first two and just using his inspectional. And I'll go through what I mean by each of these. But the inspectional phase is simply for discovery, should comprise, and this is where you can use budgeting, uh, 5 to 10% of your time. Analytical is the bulk. That's where you're actually reading every word. And that is for understanding 60 to 70 percent of your budgeted time. And then finally, the organized stage, where you recall and gather your notes and prepare to actually write the analysis. Okay, so it's you're reading through it three times, but not really. So don't you know have a heart attack. Okay, first level, the inspectional reading. Okay, what's important here is to recognize that most good books. Um, 
are, are structured in an hourglass format on several levels. Okay, so you, I've got a picture of an hourglass over there for those of you who might not know what I'm talking about. Uh, the primary ideas, the important ideas, are typically presented at the beginning and the end in various levels throughout the book. So uh, the book itself, usually the beginning of the book and the end of the book are going to have the most important ideas. Each chapter is going to be structured this way. The most important ideas of the chapter beginning, most important ideas of the end. Each section within the chapter, if there are sort of subheadings, each section the author is, is laying out, same structure. And even each paragraph. Typically, we'll have a topic sentence, we'll narrow down, and then broaden out again. So one very helpful technique uh, even just for speed reading. You know, people usually think that speed reading means people just can read every word fast. Um, in, for some people it does, but I use this technique to speed read all the time. If I just want to get the general sense of a book, I'll read the introduction and the conclusion, the first, first and last section of every chapter, and then the first and last sentence of every paragraph, and skip everything else. You can't get a full analytical reading done that way, but you can get a general sense of a book just focusing on the beginning and end of each of these different elements. Um, and then the more specific information, the supporting evidence of the author's arguments are going to be at the narrow point of the hourglass. So when you're doing analytical reading for a book review, you have to read you know, the supporting stuff. But the first pass through a book, you can just do a basic, uh, a basic um, inspectional reading. Uh, so if you're going to read it analytically, you probably wouldn't do what I just said. Introduction, conclusion, first section, last section. You probably wouldn't get in that depth because you're going to do that anyway. But nevertheless, I would suggest before you read it analytically, uh, doing at least one level of inspectional by paying attention to uh, the following elements. The cover. Really? Yeah. Uh, a good book and a good publisher are going to tell you what the book is about just by the cover and especially by the subtitle. Usually titles of books are something witty and colorful, but your subtitle is important. There's one book I'm thinking of, and I won't, I won't uh, go into details because some of you in Congregational Song will review this next semester, uh, but the, 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 the subtitle gives the thesis, and on so many people write the review of the book and totally miss the thesis, and it's right there on the cover. So pay attention to the cover. All right. Number two, the table of contents. Look through the table of contents. See if you can discern what's going to be going on in the book, the flow of the argument, the, the, the primary uh, topics covered. Same thing with the index. Flip through the index and look at what kinds of subjects are uh, referenced in the book. It's going to give you an introductory idea, so you already have some ideas floating before you actually dive into the book. If you just dive in cold turkey, you might not know the context for what you're uh, looking at. But if you, if you look at the table of contents in the index, you're going to have some idea already. Bibliography, same thing. Look at the titles of the books in the bibliography. It's going gonna, it's gonna to frame your mind to be ready for what the book is going to talk about. Uh, introduction. Okay, It's important to read that introduction. Nine times out of ten, the author is going to give you your thesis or at least direct you in that direction. Conclusion, I mentioned those two areas already. Uh, any, you know, flip through, are there any pictures? <laughs> are there any, ta yeah, are there any tables, examples, diagrams? Just flip through and see if you can find those sorts of things. Again, it will set your frame of reference to be ready to dive into the analytical level of the, of the reading. Section headings, just flip through, look at the bold section headings. The author has chosen those as what he thinks are the main ideas. You can get a basic sense of a book by never reading a word of the book and just reading the chapter titles and the section headings. It's going to give you a basic uh, idea of what's going on. And then any special type or formatting, italics, bold, underline. Sometimes a book will have call-outs where they pull out quotes and make them distinct. You know, flip through and look at those sorts of things. Again, your, your, your whole purpose, I mean, at one level, if you're just speed reading, you can do this much and be done. A lot of times I'll get a new book, do this much, and think, eh, not worth it. And I won't go any further. Of course, if you're writing a book review, you have to go further. So, uh, But sometimes this might be just a good introduction to a book. 
But even if you're going to read it completely, doing this step will help set your frame of reference for a really good analytical read of the book. So what about the analytical uh, reading stage? What are some things that you should uh, be paying attention to? And there's even some preparatory things here. Number one, know the author. We'll talk about in a moment that at the beginning of any good book review, you're going to find some biographical information about the author. The purpose of that is not just arbitrary. Uh, the purpose for the reader is by you knowing a little bit of the background of the author, his education, his denominational affiliation, his theological presuppositions, you're going to be able to come to the book with, again, with a frame of reference for analyzing what's going on. So do a little preliminary research. Look up the Wikipedia article on the guy. Okay? You should never cite Wikipedia. Wikipedia is never a, a final source, but it's often a good place to start. You can at least get some basic information and then corroborate it with some other sources. Uh, know a little bit about the author. Very similarly, know the context. In other words, many authors are writing in response to a larger debate or in response to another author or within the context of a certain philosophical discussion. If you know that coming in, and the author might not always tell you, he might in his introduction, but he might not always tell you. So doing a little bit of preliminary research, just Google the guy, Google the book, and see what comes up. It might, it might tip you off. Knowing the context in which he is writing before you even start reading will help you be able to see what his point is. Use your unconscious mind. And here's what I mean by this. This is another reason you can't just wait to the night before to finish reading the book. Some people might be able to do that, but most people, myself included, have to read the book and then set it aside for a little bit and let it just percolate for a while. That's really what it often takes to be able to really analyze somebody and especially be able to organize your thoughts. A lot of people, you know, I got a book review coming up, so they read it in two days and they just plop down and start typing. You, you may be like a super writer, super thinker, and there's some people like that. I'm not one of them. I have to read, set it aside, let it think for a while, and then all of a sudden, it's amazing, I've got this idea of how I want to organize my thoughts, and then I sit down and write it. So allow yourself some time as you budget. Now, you're busy students, and you've got 12 book reviews to write this semester and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, there's limits, but I recommend leaving some time to allow the thoughts to percolate. Have a dialogue with the author. Mark it up. Let me show you an example of this. So here's just one book I pulled off the shelf. I like to use little tabs you can get at any, do any office uh, supply store. Anything I quote or think is important as I'm reading analytically, I'll underline, I'll write in the margins, and then I'll just tab it. And that way later in my organization stage, I know where I want to go. Or if I'm not tabbing it, at least I have, I've, I've uh, written some things. Uh, dialogue with your author. I talk to the author in my marginal notes. I mean, you'll find things like just randomly, no way, uh, disagree with him here. I think he assumes way too much in the way of optimistic power of Christians in culture. You know, I'm just constantly talking, you know, possibly, uh, exactly this is the problem. Uh, have to think about this more. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly dialoguing with the author with my pen, not only does that help me later when I'm organizing for writing, but just practically speaking, it helps you stay awake. Uh, it helps you keep your mind active. Uh, it's very easy. You know, if you've been in my office, I have a wonderful leather easy chair that I read in, you know, low lighting. I've got to have that pen, and I'm scribbling the whole time talking to the author as I write to help keep my mind active, and then later in the organization stage, I can go back to that. Okay. Questions to ask while reading. And I'm just going to bullet point these and we'll talk about specifically uh, some of these here in a moment. What is the general subject matter? Obviously, should be easy to, to summarize. What is the theme? So now we're narrowing from the general subject matter to the theme. What is the purpose of the book? Why is he writing it? Is he responding to someone else? Does he... I think there's a problem uh, out there with something. Why is he writing the book? Then, 
what is the main thesis. And by thesis, we'll talk about it in a moment, we mean his primary argument. What is this author trying to prove, disprove, explain, argue, analyze, excuse me, etc. And again, I want to emphasize there's a difference between purpose and thesis. Okay, and we'll I'll highlight that again in a, in a moment. And then, what are the primary arguments used in support of the thesis? So here's his argument, and here's a list of 7, 10, 15 arguments and sub-arguments that he uses in this document to support his primary thesis. Or the secondary arguments. Okay, so there's, there's the list. Thesis, primary argument, secondary, secondary arguments. That's where the bulk of the analysis is, is going to happen. Okay, so what do I mean by these things? Subject, thesis, purpose, theme. Well, the subject is just a general area, one word. Worship. Theme is going to be a phrase that narrows the subject matter. And this may seem elementary, but if you ask yourself this, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, again, give you a better frame of reference in narrowing down uh, what you need to do for analyzing the book. Purpose is the immediate cause. Thesis is the argument. So there's the difference. Thesis, and it could be a number of, of variations, the author's beliefs about a particular aspect of the theme, the book's philosophical conclusions, the proposition the author intends to prove, something along those lines. And you should be able to express it very simply without metaphor, without figurative language, in one declarative sentence. Uh, Christians must be actively engaged in the culture. Something simple, something even imperative, declamatory, uh, uh, simple sentence that states what the author is trying to argue. Okay. Um, so one quick example of, of difference between purpose and thesis. And if you're taking my congregational song next semester, pay attention. <laughs> so uh, the, the book Why Johnny Can't Sing Hymns by T. David Gordon, which some of you have read, some of you will read. Uh, I've read a lot of reviews that say the thesis of this book is that Johnny can't sing hymns. I mean, that's not the thesis. That's the purpose. That's why he's writing. His thesis is to answer the question why he can't. And I won't give you what that thesis is, but that's an example of the difference between thesis and purpose. Usually, well, not usually. It, it all depends on the author's writing style. The purpose is going to be right there on the surface, especially in the introduction. The thesis might be a little bit more difficult to, to discern, and the author may or may not state it right out. You know, Some authors are going to say, my thesis is. But even there, be careful, because sometimes authors use the word thesis a little differently. Sometimes they use thesis to mean presupposition. Okay, So even there, be careful. Other authors treat it more inductively, where they build their case and don't state their thesis till the end. Some authors might not even clearly state their thesis. So that's where it becomes a little bit difficult. But recognize the difference between purpose and thesis. Okay, So that's the analytical stage. Those are some things to look for questions to ask as you read every word of the book. If you constantly have that in your mind, it'll help you not get lost in the details and, and keep the big picture the whole time. You should always be asking, how does this section support the thesis? What is this doing argumentatively in support of the primary uh, point? OK, then we get to the final stage. So we've got the inspectional stage where we're just scanning to set the context. The analytical stage, where we're really diving down, reading every word and, tr a word and trying to figure things out. And then the organizational stage. I would sit down with a piece of paper, probably after some time. You've read it analytically, and you've set it aside for a day or two. You've allowed it to percolate a little bit. Don't just sit down and write the review. Stream of consciousness. A lot of reviews I read seem like you know somebody read the book, sat down, and then just started typing. Okay, so this is what I think. Uh, but take some time to organize. It doesn't have to be long. But first, just write out the purpose. Well, why did he write this? And what is his thesis? And write an outline. What are the primary arguments? Okay, I'm arguing this thesis. The author's arguing this thesis. Here are 
points, the seven points that he uses to, to defend his thesis. Depending on the author, the way that these are laid out might be different. Some authors, some arguments in support of thesis are uh, very much uh, deductive sort of, um, in some ways, detached points. Here are seven reasons that I'm going to develop that support the thesis. Other authors are building a case. So in order, for, in order for one argument to be true, the previous has to be true. Okay? Either way, you can still outline them. But as you're doing that, as, how you word it, you know, sort of <laughs> rehearse in your own mind how the argument flows, because you'll want to reflect that in your book review. Then collect the pertinent quotations to illustrate the thesis and the argument. So I've written down the purpose of Andy Crouch's culture making. I've written down what I think his thesis is. I've written down an outline, probably having to refer back of what I think are his arguments. Now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to pick out some, some quotes or some things that I've underlined or thought that are important that illustrate each of these points. I might not use all of those in my book review. You don't want your book review you know, chock full with quotations, but you're going to want a couple. Um, so you know, begin, begin organizing this way. And then compile a list of strong and weak, weak portions. So, so far, this has been pretty objective. Here's his thesis, here's his purpose, here's his arguments. Now you're going to start to say, what was strong about his arguments and thesis? Not what was strong about features of the book. That's what I get a lot. Like, he writes well. OK, maybe you can put that in a book review, but I'm looking for something deeper. Um, he was, uh, his arguments were obscure. Okay, we're getting a little better. That's something worthy of saying. But I want even deeper than that. This point did not support his thesis because. This point was very relevant, clearly articulated, and supported his main argument because. There needs to be reason behind it. You are coming at the subject as someone who uh, is analyzing it from a particular perspective, and I want to know that perspective. Sometimes it might be necessary to research supplemental areas. In other words, you read this argument and you don't agree with it, and maybe you have in your own mind uh, specific reasons why this argument is weak. But sometimes you're going you're to say, I don't agree with this, and you might have to go look up some things to substantiate your disagreement or your agreement. It might be some scriptural support, and you might have to do a little reading and searching and then concordance to support your analysis. Uh, it might be you might have read another book that contradicts this argument. You might want to refer to that. This is weak. This doesn't work for these reasons. So-and-so has a better perspective here. Okay? They're, 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 uh, that's often a, a very helpful uh, thing to do. Okay, so that's all reading. We haven't started writing the book review yet. Writing the book review then should come fairly easily with various levels of, of uh, difference in skill of writing. But if you've done that work in preparation, then writing the book review should come pretty, sim pretty simply. So what are elements of a good book review? You're going to begin with, and, and a lot of this is just basic style stuff that you'll find in the style manual. I highly recommend you look at the book review section of the, of the style manual. It's got some good information there. You'll start with the basic bibliographical information, just like you would in a bibliography. You know, author's name, title, city, state, uh, location, and date. Then you'll also include how many pages and the price of the book. Just go look on the publisher's website and see what the, the retail price is. Okay, this is information, again, for someone who's not read the book. In the book review, it's helpful for them to know whether or not they want to buy it. Okay, so that's, you always, always include that. Many of the book reviews that I read just sort of dive right in. Okay? I'm running a book review on Andy Crouch's culture making, and I begin with, Andy Crouch is, okay, that's okay, but remember, you want to... You wanna, uh, gain an audience for your book review, start out with something that's going to grip their attention. Um, summarizing the author's purpose might be a good idea. Um, you know, Christians today don't know what to do with culture. Andy Crouch in Culture Making deals with this issue and then go on. 
something, something at the beginning, your opening statement that'll sort of uh, give us some idea, or maybe even quoting. I did a book review for Thamelios a couple of years ago on uh, Brian Chappell's Christ-Centered Worship, and I opened with, structures tell stories. So says Brian Chappell in his book, blah, 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 you know, because that's a provocative statement that, that provides sort of, a, it's how he begins his book too, and provides sort of the foundation for the rest of the book. You know, something provocative, a quote, uh, the author's purpose, maybe a, a sort of a thesis statement, something to, to grip the author's, uh, the reader's attention. Okay, then you're gonna have your introduction, yeah. Is this gonna change depending on the manual of style that you use? Is this format pretty much? Uh, maybe, but generally a manual of style is not gonna get this specific. Uh, this is more of a stylistic thing, so yeah. Uh, then you're gonna, the, the, you're gonna have your introduction. Obviously the opening sentence is gonna be part of the introduction, but in the introduction, you're gonna wanna uh, briefly introduce the author, his credentials, why we should even you know, worry about this book, uh, perhaps some of the context. You know, so-and-so is a professor at such and such a school. He writes this book in response to the growing debate over such and such. You know, something that gives the reader the context of the book that you have uh, discerned in your own background research for reading the book. Then, you're gonna give us the purpose and the thesis statement. In just a couple sentences, right at the beginning after you've introduced the author in the context, tell us why he wrote it and what his thesis is. Blow that, you know, uh, take care of that right off at the beginning of the review. In that clear, sort of uh, declarative sentence without a lot of pizzazz. Okay, then you may have a five to, to ten sentence summary. Now, I will say there are, you know, there are multiple ways of writing a book review. Uh, we're going to look next at the bulk of the book review being tracing the arguments. You may combine these two. You may say, I want to summarize along with diving down and, and analyzing the arguments. That's a possible way. I would start here, though, and this is actually how I like to write reviews, if you haven't written a lot of reviews, just do a brief summary. This book is in two sections. The first section deals with such and such. The second deals with such and such. You know, very, very brief survey of what happens in the book. But that shouldn't be the bulk. A lot of students get stuck on the summary. Chapter one did this. Chapter two did this. Chapter three did this. That's, that's not what I'm looking for, okay? Brief summary, but then the bulk of the review should be to trace the arguments. You've already stated the thesis. You've given us a general overview. The bulk of the review should be to thoroughly explain the, the arguments used to support the thesis. How did the author develop his thesis? What did he use to prove it? Show us. If it's a series of, of disconnected arguments, tell us that. If you've discerned that there's a progression of thought, tell us that and show us how that is. Okay, so this is more of an objective analysis of what's going on. And again, you may be able to combine this with what comes next, the analysis. <laughs> It's possible to trace the arguments and analyze them as you go. That's, that's fine. I would recommend starting here, though, just to keep it simple. As you get more comfortable with writing book reviews, or if you have experience writing book reviews, you can combine a lot of these things, as long as all of the elements are in some way present. Okay, so this, is just, this should be the bulk. And then comes what should be then uh, second most important, and that is evaluation. Critical evaluation of both the strengths and the weaknesses, hopefully you should be able to, to, to uh, list both strengths and weaknesses. I mean, you might come across a total lemon and say this thing stinks, wasn't anything good about it. Or you might, come, you might be able to find something that is just knocked you off your, your feet and you couldn't find anything weak. Probably not, but maybe. But you should try to find some strengths and some weaknesses. Again, explain and support your opinion, not just I disagree with his assertion. So what? Okay, who are you? You are someone, if you can say, I disagree with his assertion because this contradicts what he says. This other author 
uh, argues better for this point. If so, if something like that. Some, some, uh, this scripture contradicts what he says. I've seen some very good analysis by students analyzing the author's analy uh, arguments by showing how it really contradicts what scripture itself says. That's a, a, a very good way. And then your conclusion. In two to three sentences, briefly comment on why a book is important, who might be a good audience for the book. You know, this, is, this would be good as a textbook. This is very hard to read, so only scholars are gonna be able to wade through it. You know, something that tells us the readability, uh, format of the book, you might say it's got you know, some appendices, some tables in it, it's chock full of pictures that are pretty and help keep my attention. You know, <laughs> tell us about the book generally, features of the book, and that kind of thing. I wanna give you a real life example of putting this into practice. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, okay, I've got to use a real life example, but I want to use a book everybody's familiar with. I was thinking, what book could I use that everybody is familiar with? And I came up with Green Eggs and Ham. Now you're talking. Okay, so I'm going to show you real life how to do a book review of Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss. Anybody not familiar with this book? A couple. Most of you are. And we'll do a summary here in a moment. Okay, so this is obviously silly, but I just want to show you all the elements and a basic uh, progression through reading and doing the book review. Okay, so green eggs and ham. Here we go. Author. I looked this up on Wikipedia. <gasps> okay, good place to start. I wouldn't cite it. You can't trust it implicitly, but sometimes it's just a good place to get some basic information. The author is Theodore Seuss Geisel, a.k.a. Dr. Seuss. I looked at some information on him and I found this statement. Again, information about the author and about his context will help you interpret the book, even something as simple as Green Eggs and Ham. I found this statement, which, which I think is interesting. He was a perfectionist. He would sometimes spend up to a year on a book. Really? Well, what does that tell you about him? This wasn't just, he wasn't just writing a simple children's book. He had a purpose behind it. It took him a year to write it. Okay. Uh, it wasn't uncommon for him to throw out 90 95% of his material, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Interesting background information. Uh, I, I found this interesting, which again, as we'll see, I think plays into this book. He drew political cartoons that often had deeper meaning uh, to even what, uh, deeper meaning to even what he wrote for children. I don't know what I meant there. But anyway. Uh, in, other words, in other words, he wrote cartoons that had deeper meaning, which gives a possible indication that his children's writing, even a silly story, perhaps had deeper meaning. Okay, here's a summary of the book. Sam tries to convince his friend to eat green eggs and ham. His friend refuses. But after much persistence, the friend tries the dish and finds that he likes it. Basic summary. Okay, so question. What is the thesis? Yeah, those of you who know Green Eggs and Ham, what's the thesis of the book? Persistence. Possibly. If you try it, you might like it. If you try it, you might like it. Possibly. Okay, here are some possible theses, and I'm listing these out of experience of what I see students put as the thesis to show you, you know, what to avoid. Green Eggs and Ham are good. <laughs> okay? At a basic level, of, well, that, that's the thesis. Is that really the thesis, though? Uh, how about, there are many possible places to eat green eggs and ham. <laughs> okay, again, a very surface analysis of the thesis of the book. You should try green eggs and ham. Okay, we're getting a little closer, but the question is, is that really the point? Okay, and here's, that's another example of where I see a lot of students who still are sort of surface in what they discern as the thesis. But sometimes you're going to have to get deeper. And this is a perfect book of an un, uh, perfect example of a book with an unstated thesis. If you're just looking for a thesis that's stated, you might do one of these. But I would suggest the thesis is try new things because you might just like them. That's never stated as such in the book. Okay. Obviously, silly example. All right. Finally, we're, we're done here after this. Here is the book review I wrote for Dr. Seuss Theological Journal. Okay? Um, but I just want to read, I want to read this and show you all the all the all the pertinent points 
of our book review. Okay, so I've got my title, I've got my bibliographical information there. It's a long book, 62 pages, wow. Okay, so I start with a provocative quote that grips my audience's attention. Try them and you may, I say. In Dr. Seuss's clever and witty way, Theodore S. Geisel, author of many children's popular and successful, uh, yeah, too many children there, many popular and successful children's books, motivates children to be open to trying new things because they just might like them. I've already stated the thesis. I've given background information, provocative quote, background information, context, and thesis, all in two sentences. It'll probably be a little more in a substantial book, but it doesn't have to be much more. Here's my summary. In Geisel's engaging book, Green Eggs and Ham, a character named Sam I Am tries to convince his friend to try a dish called Green Eggs and Ham, though his friend is very resistant to the idea, as he expresses in the above quote. Finally, his friend tries it and discovers that he actually likes the strained dish. Here is my analysis of the arguments. Geisel presses home his point to children in his book through several means. First, he reveals the stubbornness of Sam's friend by having him refuse the dish no matter what the environment or circumstances. In a house, and by the way, here is the appropriate way to include page numbers. Uh, you like that cool laser pointer? Uh, in parentheses, before the punctuation, either comma or, or period, if you have a quote, uh, like here, the quote goes before the, the citation and then the ending punctuation after. Okay, we see a lot of mistakes on that. Anyway, in a house, page 19, on a train, 33, on a boat, 44, etc. The fact that he insists that he does not like the dish despite the persistence of Sam clearly illustrates his stubbornness. Second, Geisel demonstrates the need to try new things through the persistence of Sam, which may be a thesis as well. Obviously, Sam is convinced that his friend will like the meal if he simply tries it, and therefore he attempts to motivate his friend to try it by simply changing the circumstances. Third, Geisel shows that new things can be pleasant by making his character express gratitude to Sam when he finds that he indeed likes the dish. And here's an example of using a quote to support what I'm talking about. I do so like green eggs and ham. Thank you, thank you, Sam I am. Okay, here is my uh, analysis of his arguments. The point of green eggs and ham is convincing to children who might otherwise neglect trying new things. The friend's stubbornness is clearly portrayed, revealing the futility of rejecting new things. The only potential weakness to the goal of the book is the fact that children reading a silly story may not even recognize the underlying thesis. And then here is my conclusion. Green Eggs and Ham is an enjoyable children's book written using a total of only 50 words, none of them exceeding five letters except for the word anywhere, page 16. Thus, it is a fitting work for young children to both learn to read and gain an important life's lesson. Okay, silly exercise, but all of the elements are there. Okay, and what I would expect from a good book.